Honored to be here with the legendary John Parr. It is a pleasure to meet you. How are you? Happy birthday, Matthew. Great to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a great gift for me. Uh, first things first, uh, Happy talk about the to you. <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, talk about the film uh, Unconquered. Uh, it, I know it's a film that you directed. It looks incredible. Talk about it. Well, well, it's been it's the work of my life. Uh, I've spent the last year. I met two soldiers, two ex soldiers that were severely injured in the line of duty, um, and um, they were they were mentally and physically hurt, and. Um, I promised them that I would make a, a film for them, not thinking, because I wasn't really a filmmaker. I'd not, you know, I'd made one film before, but I'm not very technical. And um, I, I was going to use a, a video team and COVID came and the people that said they were going to back it came and went. And so it was just me and nothing. So I bought the equipment, uh, spoke to a load of buddies of mine and um, we made Unconquered. Uh, we shot it quite quickly in about 10 days, but it took a year of post-production to, to do. It's very, it looks like a Hollywood movie. It's, there's a lot of people can see the trailers online so they can see the trailer, but um, it, it's, it's very special. And, it, and it, it's to highlight the, uh, you know, the, the what a lot of people go through in life. Even sometimes you don't realize you're, you've got a disability sometimes you think. Yeah, you think you're just limping along, you know. So it's a film about physical and mental disability and about finding a way forward and hopefully putting, like St. Elmo's Fire was about disablement, you know, that the, you people just get a charge out of it. So that's, and we've started, you know, it's going to be a big uphill battle, uh, but we've won, we won, we won yesterday. We won Best Documentary in Athens yesterday. In America, we won the Accolade uh festival we won all four categories we went in so it's beginning but it is a little acorn as you know these things are, are, are you know a slow grow well thank you so much for telling the story now that you're a filmmaker is it something that you want to do again yeah i uh i'm 70 years old now so uh i figure i want to try and be a filmmaker for the next 20 and then decide what i'm going to do <laughs> You don't look a day over 26, by the way. Cheers, man. Yeah, I've got my soft filter on. I've got my ring light. I've got it all going, man. <laughs> well, I'm not often rendered speechless, but when I read that St. Elmo's uh, Fire, the song was created and edited in 24 hours. I found myself having a really difficult time coming up with words. That is absurd. Yeah, it was a very quick process. Um, it was a, a very strange one. Uh, David Foster had... Uh, you know, he was my an idol of mine, and um, I used to sit on my in my little house. I used to sit, listen to those records that he made, and I would cry. I literally would cry and think, "These guys are doing everything I dream of doing, and I can how can I compete?" And a year later, I was on the road with Toto, and then David called, and then we were right saying I was fine. So, to anybody out there, you know, just keep don't give up you know you know it's it, you know some win some not but keep keep going and yeah it was we wrote the song really quickly really quickly and but i was struggling with the lyrics and joel schumacher the director came down and tried he'd written the film as well as directed it and joel tried to fill me full of enthusiasm for the lyrics and i just couldn't get it and then david showed me a video Lil was video cassette in those days, a little like a little news item from a local news station about this young guy in a wheelchair who was going to wheel around the world on the Man in Motion tour. I went back to the hotel that night, the hairs on the back of my neck still standing up, and wrote the story of what happened two years later. He wheeled around the world, and we've raised two hundred eighty million dollars for spinal research. You know, again, little tiny little tiny things that if you believe in and push. Yeah, well, you were just uh, incredible. Something that I, I found really, really cool. You've written and performed 10 major motion picture theme songs. What is, what, what do you think the key is for writing a theme song? Because clearly you have it down. Um, I think, I think the one gift, and I do think it's a gift. I don't, I don't take any responsibility. I think in life, you know, if as soon as you think it's you, 
the ego takes over. And so no, I mean, I'm just the vessel. Call it the universe, call it God, whatever. I just think I'm a craftsman. I work on what I've been given. Uh, but I've always the gift I think I have is empathy. I'm, I'm pretty good at walking in another person's shoes. So if I write songs for the military, a lot of military mums that lost sons and daughters say, how could you possibly know? And it just, I've been gifted to be able to do that. And so if I see a movie and it's an inspiring movie, my aim is to be just one of those team of horses pulling the wagon. I want to be, I want to be dragging that film uh, and that three or four minute song's got to encapsulate all that that director's trying to get across. And so uh, back in the 80s, um, there was a lot of that. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you don't see it so much now, do you? You don't see so many title tracks of movies. The Bond movie has one, but I see so mo many movies lately that should have had that killer song and they don't have it. But then you see, it's all, again, being chosen to do it, these film companies, they have a blackboard and they have a hit list of who's in the charts. And, hey, we should get Justin Bieber or we should get Lady Gaga or whoever, whoever's hot. And I was hot for a couple of years in the 80s. And so I was the go to. And fortunately, they realized I was good at it. So I was like back to back. I think me and Phil Collins, we kind of bush, you know, Phil, Phil did a bunch of them, too, you know, and um some of them were pretty, I must say, you know, pretty landmark songs, you know, even though the record company didn't like me doing it, so they never released them. So I would have a couple of biggest movies in the world that I'd got the title track, but record company would release it because they wanted me to be a rocker. So I'd got Three Men and a Baby and they wouldn't release the song, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a hit, I think, you know. But the main thing is it's in the movie and it does the job, you know. Are there any uh, movies that you saw recently while going to the theater where you're like, damn, I really wish I wrote the song for that? Yeah, yeah, there was. I, I can't think what I want. I've got a bad memory. There's been a couple lately I've been to see and I just thought, man, why didn't you, why didn't you? And sometimes, you know, they throw something in. You know, they might want to put something a bit urban in just to keep it cool. And it's wrong, you know. It's nothing wrong with urban music, but it, but it just was, they're just trying to be hip. You know, and, and uh, yeah, so there's been, I, I can't pinpoint anything, but it does frustrate me. The biggest one that got away from me was uh, way back and before your time, 25, longer than 25 years ago. It's a movie called Big. Do you remember the Tom Hanks movie, Big? You probably don't. Mm -hmm. But it's a great movie. It came out in about 86, 87. And uh, my friend and I, Betsy, Dirk and Mathis, we wrote uh, this, probably the best movie tune we ever wrote. And um, they didn't use it. And and I still look at that movie and think, man, that's fitted so perfectly at the end, you know. And that's what it is, you know. It's uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But I think they miss a beat because um, you get a great song. It, it makes the movie live. I mean, look at St. Elmo's Fire. That movie's kind of long forgotten unless you're an 80s kind of, you know, era person. But the song... Certainly in this country, I think in America too, you know, song is always on the radio here 37 years later, you know. Well, you're an incredibly decorated songwriter, clearly. Very talented vocalist. I am kind of <laughs> curious, which do you prefer? Because your passion for songwriting exudes. Do you, do you like both for different reasons? Which one do you prefer? I think when I was a younger man, when I was a younger man, I was a gunslinger. So I was the, I was the, fast gun you know was as a guitar player and as a singer i would just work myself to death look at who was the headline you know like in sport you just look at a michael jordan or you'd look at you know or a tim tebow in his day and you'd think well that's the bar that's what i gotta work to and um so yeah certainly as a younger man i relished slaying people guitar players particularly with my guitar and making it look easy they'd say i was mine and just i'd, I'd thrive on it Vocally, I mean, in my era and before my era, some of the greatest vocalists of all time, male and female. So that bar was so incredibly high with Stevie Wonder, Tom Jones, you know, um, just, you know, Steve Perry, you know, uh, you know, uh, Lou Graham. So they were my they were my targets, if you like, you know, and I'm not saying I got there, but I was jumping up trying to touch that bar, you know, and. It's kind of different now because, uh, yeah, you know, we've got a few great singers, but it's really more about uh, that personal collection, connection. I think, you know, people like um, 
Ed Sheeran. You know, I think Ed's, Ed's done marvels with his voice. You know, he's kind of got an okay voice that he makes the most of, but his connection with his lyrics and his and his uh, verve, the way, you know, it's different. You know, you don't necessarily have to be king of the hill as a singer. It helps, but you don't have to be. Yeah. Well, you mentioned some uh, iconic names there. Uh, when I say Beach Boys, Hart, Brian Adams, sharing the stage with Travolta, Michael J. Fox, Celine Dion, Paul Anka, Rob Lowe. I mean, the, the list goes on for all the people who you have uh, collaborated with. Tina Turner, the uh, the late, yeah. great Tina Turner. Sure. Uh, I, I want you to kind of share some of your favorite memories with her because I know you do have a past with her. Oh, Tina. Yeah, Tina would be number one for me, really. Uh, yeah, Tina. Uh, I did uh, 40 shows with Tina on the private dance tour. I got to know her a little bit. She was a mentor to me. She actually picked me for the tour. She uh, she heard Sir Elmo's and said, I want him. And so that was a great bond. Um, I would I would uh, do my show, get changed, wait for the lights to go down, and then I'd go and sit in the crowd and I'd watch every show. And it never missed a beat. It was 120 mile an hour constant i've seen her go, go on sick i've seen her go, go on exhausted and you would never know um she would um when she did the she did 180 shows on private dancer and she'd be in her late 40s she did 180 shows around the world and when she was in america i think she did 100 over 100 and she stayed only in four hotels on that tour so it's the east you know midwest west what if she stayed in a hotel so she would do the show, get on the, her plane, go back to the, the hotel in that place. She wouldn't get up until four o'clock the next, you'd never see it till four o'clock the next day. Then she'd come to the gig, wherever that fly to the gig, and she it was sponsored by Pepsi. So she'd meet everybody in that town from Pepsi. She'd know their names, she'd shake hands with them, she'd be very personable. Go on and do her show and then get back on the plane. And I met her son, uh, towards the end of the tour and he said you know I've not seen my mum for nearly three months and he said because she needs every bit of energy she has just to give her all to the crowd and I don't know any artist that would do that but that was Tina that she just completely gave and then a funny side I lost my voice I, I rarely used to lose my voice then and I lost my voice and my wife had flown over to see the show and I thought oh man I tried to do one two down the mic and you know nothing and I went I thought well Tina will know so I went and she used to call me Jack what's the matter Jack I said uh, she said and she went through my screens what I do I used to do this thing when I walk I'd go hey and the audience go hey and go hey and, go. and she did all this and she you got to stop doing that Jack you got to stop doing it. but she was doing it and uh she told me a trick she said you got to gargle gargle with uh, hot port port wine don't you swallow it, Jack. Don't you swallow it, man. You spit it out. And then I got my show and I got my, uh, I got, you know, my wife saw the show and I sang. And that was down to Tina showing me the trick. And uh, so any singers, gargle with hot pork, spit it down the sink and you'll get the show. That is incredible. There will be another one like Tina, huh? Never. No, I think, I think, A, the time, just the time of innocence and, um, you know, all that. And of course, everything she went through. Um, but you're blessed in life. I mean, her life was cursed and then it was blessed. And uh, I think the big thing in her life, apart from her love life at the end, when she met the, you know, the man of her dreams in Switzerland, you know, 20 years ago, I think Roger Davis, not many people know about Roger, but Roger was really what every artist would want to be as a manager. Every show Tina did, Roger Davis was there. I mean, You've been to shows. How many times do you see the manager? He's usually sitting and smoking a cigar somewhere on a beach or whatever. But Roger was there carrying the suitcase. I've seen him in Germany. I've seen him in, in you know, around the world. Roger's always been there with Tina. And no no hairs and graces either. Even when she was king of the hill, I've seen her, um, you know, running out of the room with a suitcase, you know, just doing her own thing. Because she was, a, she was a, a woman of the people. You know, she really was. You know, just an an exceptionally talented person that, that was just uh, 
you know, just a black lady that, that uh, came up the hard way and she knew what the truth was. And she, she never lost that common touch with people, you know, and I think that's what the audience got. I'm sure on Concord is going to be a gigantic part of it, but tell me the goals for the remainder of this year, next year, what should fans of yours expect to see from you? Well, uh, this year is big film festival push for the film and just to try and get as many champions in life. You always need champions to, you know, to help you along the way. So that's trying to get a few champions. I'm going to do a few fundraisers, uh, I want to do a few things in my own country, maybe in American Canada too. Just good course things. I, you know, I've had a good life. I, you know, a lot of my life has been put back and I get a big thrill out of it. So if I can do stuff for good, whatever it be, film or whatever, I want to do that. Uh, I got a new album. I'm, I'm sitting in my studio now. We're probably a month off. We made a film of the making of the record and it's it's a throwback. Anybody that kind of was with me back in the 80s, it's a record that is very, very rock. It's like, you know, balls to the wall, honest, good songs, well performed, I believe. So that'll be coming in the new year. And um, yeah, I mean, brand new, man. It's like, it's not the old game. It's back out, having another go and new pastures. And I want to be a filmmaker. I want to, I've got a couple of films I've written that uh, I really think uh, be the kind of film that you go to the theatre or you see it on the on the on the stream in, and you you come out of the film feeling better than you went in. And I think we need a few of those lately. I think we really do. You know. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore, John. Keep up the great work. I'm going to leave the floor to you. If there's anyone you'd like to thank, uh, any shout outs, anything like that. Well. I, well, firstly, thank you, Matthew, for doing this. And happy birthday again, man. And um, I just want to say hi to everybody out there and anybody that's struggling, you know, really struggling. Um, I've, I've been close to it when people have, when the light's gone out at the end of the tunnel. And um, it's just in that moment, you know, and you can switch the lights off for good. And I, I know a few people that have done that. And it's just sometimes in that moment. So if you if you've got a buddy that you know needs a hand or somebody you think needs a hand you know don't go I'll, i must get around to it just get around to it because to my cost i've been a day late so don't be a day late 